Hey everybody, welcome back to the Quest for the Bestness. It's the podcast from Backlot Banter, where once a year we review every single Best Picture nominee. Today, we are talking about Celine Song's new film, Past Lives. It's a bit of a... Yes. Her only film. Her Her only film. debut. Yeah. Yeah. Newest. Newest. That's a good point. That is true. Uh I do not lie. I do not lie. It is her new film. (laughs) Mm Mm-hmm. It's a bit of a romance movie, a little bit of a drama. I am excited to hear you guys' thoughts on this because it's been a long time since I saw it. I remember watching it way back in June when it came out, but now I've rewatched it today in anticipation of this review. And, uh, well, I am ready to deliberate and discuss uh, the merits and uh, demerits of past lives. But before we do that, of course, there are some little bits of housekeeping that we must do. We first must remind you of what we talked about last time on the show because we had a special guest, Sam Meltzer, friend, real life friend of Backlot Banter, friend of the show, came on to help us work through the complicated- Why don't we call each other friends of the show? Yeah, oh, friend of the show, Tucker. Uh, We're all friends Mm -hmm. of the show, I would hope. I'm enemies of the show. (laughs) (laughs) We've got plenty of them. Mortal enemies with the show. Hey now, let's not be making any more. Okay. Well, Sam Meltzer helped us discuss Zone of Interest, the uh, a new film by Jonathan Glazer. That was quite the discussion that we had to really sink our teeth into a rather a dense and artistic ah. and atypical Oscar movie. But we had a, we had a fun time, and uh, well, I should tell you what it got on our on our ranked list. It got an eight point one, which puts it at spot number three out of three. So today. We will add a fourth film. Past Lives will go somewhere on the list. I'll just remind you of where everything stands, because why not? We're housekeeping. Let's keep sweeping. Yeah. It's, the list isn't really long like it is with Quest, usually. Uh-huh. Yeah. It's actually very reasonable to read out the entire list. <laughs> Standing here at three films, number one is Poor Things. Number two is The Holdovers. And number three is The Zone of Interest. One, two, three. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So... As always, write your thoughts on what we talk about in the comments below. We want to hear your opinions on not only this film, but the other films too. Maybe go back to those videos and write a, a describe down your thoughts, a little, a comment. But that's because every week we read a featured comment and Abram has gone into the depths. He's, he's waded into the jungle of our comment section and has pulled a very lucky member of our community to be featured on this episode. So I'm the luckiest member of the week. Mm-hmm. I, I did. I, I found uh, a friend of the show, uh, Trip and Fall mm-hmm. 29, uh, no, sorry, 2379. I don't yeah, want to conf- get that wrong. Don't want to confuse no, them no. with the other 2,378 Trip and Falls That's on right. YouTube. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and the reason I want to read Trip and Falls comments is because I've been holding up fingers for one, two, and three. Mm-hmm. Um, but I couldn't hold up fingers for every single episode of the original Quest for the Bestest. That's true. Uh, which is every episode that Trip and Fall has not finished watching oh. because they said <gasps> uh, on our wings. Yeah. Yeah. On our wings review, Trip and Fall writes, kudos to you all and congratulations on a great journey. Your little film was infectious. I've now watched every Quest for the Bestest video. What a fantastic ride it was. And still is, Trip and Fall. Yeah. You're still be watching. You are still watching. Trip, Trip I, hope, I hope you know about this channel. Oh, wait, oh no, it was no, on, on the new channel. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I thought, yeah. I thought it was on another channel, but... If you're watching this, I hope you know about this channel, everyone. Yeah. Rest easy. <laughs> Rest easy, Tucker. I think they got it. <laughs> I think they got it. I think they got it. Wow. Thank it's you good that we know it's good to know that we have someone that is dedicated yeah. enough. Mm-hmm. Thank you very much. I mean, I've watched a lot of quest episodes. I have not rewatched every single quest episode. So <laughs> Hey, you made them. It counts for something. It's true. Yeah. I was there. I don't think I've watched a single episode of Quest. <laughs> That's your loss, pal. That's your you loss. You love what yeah. you make, Abram. Uh-huh. I do, do, but I'm not going to fucking listen back to it. You know, that's hey. fine. Hey. Abram will love his children, but he just won't engage with them or, <laughs> you know. Support them directly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Anyway. okay. He's just there for the creation part. Uh-huh. The Let's, animation. Yeah. Let's talk about this movie, Past Live, Celine Song's debut film. Who would like to give a little plot synopsis? A recap of the journey that we go on on this movie. 
Sure. I'll I'll be, I always <laughs> love waiting until yeah, Tanner grabs it and runs with it. <laughs> <laughs> He's always ready. He's That's ready to pounce. He's strung okay. up. Past Lives is a film uh, with a very limited set of characters. Our, our central character is Nora, who grows up as a child in South Korea, but uh, as you know, uh, an adolescent moves to the United States, um, and sort of we see we sort of see we jump around in her life. Um, First, as a young adult, when she reconnects with a uh, acquaintance of hers named Hei Sung, who she left behind in South Korea, it was a friend that she went on a date with only days before leaving, actually. Um, and he's formed, I don't know, sort of, an, sort of an attachment to her or this idea of her that is now missing in his life. So he's very, very much ready to reconnect with her over Skype. Um, but, you know, as things develop and as they as they talk more and more, Nora sort of realizes that, hey, I, I got I got to focus on my own stuff. I got to focus on my life here in America. Um, hey, Song, I can't I can't be talking to you all the time. My, my mind can't always be back in South Korea. Then 12 year time jump. OK, Nora then meets uh, her Arthur. now husband, Arthur, uh, and Hey Song decides to come visit her in New York City where they are living. Um, and the most of the film, I guess the latter half of the film, really transpires over like a day and a half or two days of Nora and Haesong physically reconnecting after, you know, uh, decades, really. And it's, um, it, it, it's very heartfelt, you know, uh, and sort of uh, feelings bubble up to the surface, some, some uh, confessions bubble up to the surface, and connections are strengthened rather than severed in the film, past lives, at the end of things. Yeah. Yeah, very nice. Good job, Tanner. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to call on someone. Abram, what okay. are your oh. thoughts on Past Lives? I adore Past Lives. I think that Past Lives is a staggering film. I really, really, really enjoyed it when I first saw it um, back when it was out in theaters. Um, but on this rewatch, my, my score didn't go up a ton. That's because my score used to be a four and a half out of five stars, uh -huh. and I was showing my hand earlier. What could it possibly be now? Yeah, <laughs> it's uh, now a five out of five. Because I, I think that, to me, Past Lives is a lot of things at the same time. Mm -hmm. It's a very um, serene film in a lot of ways, but it's also so emotionally discordant and so emotionally raw that I think the film's ability to sort of balance its atmosphere and, and, and the sense of like melancholy and peace with the really like un like unrelievable tension mm -hmm. and, and uh, conflict inherent to the relationships between um, Nora and Sung and Arthur is just absolutely incredible. And I kind of just become transfixed by their story because it's so irregular. Mm -hmm. There's even a, a digression that we'll get into from uh, Arthur where he talks about, man, what a great story this could be. Yeah, yeah. We don't t we don't learn that. What version. a what a best adapted screenplay or best original screenplay this could be. Yeah, <laughs> we, we shape up to be. Yeah, we we get a, a very tumultuous and raw and rich story in its place, and I think the movie is all the better for it. And we got to rewatch Oppenheimer. We got to rewatch uh, Anatomy of a Fall. But for me, I think on this rewatch, I just getting deeper into the emotional tenor of the film. I think it's maybe my favorite uh, that was nominated. Uh, sure. My favorite of the year was still John Wick 4. Of That's course. a different conversation. <laughs> very different. Oh, no, sorry, Godzilla. And, then and, John and Godzilla. <laughs> Those two are. Yeah, and Path Lives and Godzilla very are actually similar. very similar. And John Wick. Yeah, and yeah, John yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's a holy trilogy uh -huh. right there. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I also, I, I love this movie. I think that what makes it feel so interesting to me is that even though last time, or recently we were talking about with the holdovers, how a film can be very emotionally impactful and interesting, even if it is very simple. Um, I feel that very much here, but I th feel that even though structurally and uh, character wise, this is one of the most simple films I've seen and probably one of the most simple best picture nominees that we've gotten in terms of just three characters and like it, it's, just, it's basically just a rom drama. Uh -huh. But I think the way that it ties in themes of culture and pasts. Lives. No, oh. not that. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, really, really sets us apart and, and, and gives its own flavor. And Celine Song's direction and the the pacing and the music and the sh shot composition, the coloring, all of this gives it such a distinct vibe. And I think, again, the other thing that sort of adds us again to, I think, the cultural canon of romance films, it is it does 
feel very modern. I mean, in the way that You've Got Mail was an adaptation of The Shop Around the Corner Mm -hmm. using email in the 90s uh, with Meg Ryan and Tom Tom Hanks. This feels like an actual modern romance story. I I believe it's set in 2012, or or part of it is, and then Mm -hmm. 2024, I guess, 12 We're in the year of past Yeah, that's crazy. I didn't realize this. It's two two 12-year gaps. Uh Yeah, Um, takes place in the future. Uh Uh-huh. I guess so, yeah, unless it's taking place right now. It might be uh, in New York. <laughs> we no, don't know what time of year it is. It, it, it's very clear. It's it's spring or summer in New York. Uh, so it, it, we got to wait, still, we gotta wait a couple months, but then, uh-huh. Brooklyn, watch out. The but fateful I think, meeting between. I, I think that the way that it uses internet search history and mm-hmm. Skype and, and, and video calling feels so natural and realistic to the way that relationships are formed in the modern day it just sets it so far apart and makes it feel even more real than so many modern romance movies that lean a little bit into theatrics that this one absolutely does not with some of the most naturalistic performances and naturalistic shot composition and stuff i mean this is just a straight down the barrel very real naturalist movie and i think it's all the better for it um, yeah, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go three for three here so far. I'm gonna do the three peat and say, yeah, I fucking love past. That's a triple. Lives. Let's see if we can get a home run. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, as as Abram alluded to, you know, this film came out uh, in we we saw it in June uh, all together actually at, at the Alamo Draft House. And then, you know, as more films came out, as the award season ramped up, you're like, oh yeah, I remember. I remember liking Past Lives, but it's not really until I rewatched it that I was like. God, this is, there is something about it that grabs you, um, and it really is like a super stellar, not just like first written movie, but a first directed movie. It executes itself so well on on so many uh, so many levels. Um, and yeah, on the surface, it's it's quite simple. It you know it's three characters, it's a contemporary setting, so and so on and so forth. But like I especially this time found so much richness and um, so much legwork going on behind the scenes of every character mm, yeah. uh, and, and, and dialogue choices as sparse as they are in this film. The dialogue, especially for you know a romance film, a drama, the, the, the dialogue is quite sparse because Celine Song decides to use everyone as a very intentional sort of, um, you know, I guess sort of breath, uh, bre- what am I saying, brushstroke in this tapestry of sure. a film. And then in between, just sort of like, Flex her abilities as a visual artist, uh, and sort of like like blend these moments together in a very like warm and rich sort of uh, uh, movement from scene to scene, where like you're looking at the colors and you're just looking at the city landscapes and so on, and you're like, it doesn't feel like we're wasting any time. It feels like we're really I'm just being like sort of slowly enveloped into this film that Celine Song has designed so expertly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I really enjoyed this film the first time I saw it, and I think that I actually have kind of weakened on it a little bit since then. This time I didn't enjoy oh, it. Oh, we as biffed much. the home run. Ah. <laughs> uh, I think that uh, this film is like a really is a really excellent first watch, but I really didn't get a whole lot the second time around because I felt kind of a a lack of tension. Knowing what's going to happen in this film like really sure. spoils like the will they won't they of the romance. And so Good it was point. hard for yeah. me to get into this time around that like real central conflict of the film. But I do think that this is a a very well directed movie that is just it's nice and understated. It's nice and just like it's not trying to like wow you with the yeah. shots, but like The film is like a drizzly day. Mm-hmm. It is like a drizzly day, but then you look and like the you know the clouds part for a moment and there's the shot in which they're they're saying goodbye to each other at the beginning of the film and there's a street that goes off in one direction and a stairway that goes off in the other direction and you're like hmm m- metaphor may have visual imagery <laughs> <laughs> like, hmm. was this intentional <laughs> like like so so I um I think that there's a lot of stuff that I like I think I really enjoy how how real I, this is a very real film where characters do stuff that I'm like that's yeah that's how real life is. And, uh, but I'm going to be, I'm going to just be blunt with it that I just, I just don't really like Hey Sung's character that much this time around. I see. Yeah. I, I have, I just don't find him to have very many redeeming qualities. And I think that some of the ways that he, he performs, which might add to the complication of this film that makes, that me not liking him might actually add a little bit too, but 
if he's supposed to be a a a, a kind of romantic, like real real charming male lead, he like almost isn't that to me. He be, he starts at that point, but then as the film goes on, and especially towards we get to the end, I lose my interest in wanting to see him succeed. He he, he gets like mm. annoying to me a little bit. I'm being yeah. a little well, harsh, but it's like some of his. I don't know. I don't. I don't like him that much. Even though, I, 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 yeah. I think that maybe the your your wish for the movie to be a more traditional romance movie mm-hmm. is kind of what might be weighing down on some of the characterization mm-hmm. and the progression. Because I agree. I don't. I like. I like his song. I think Tao Yu does a great job as an actor. He's very naturalistic, um, and he has his own mannerisms. But he's a he's a pretty straightforward character. Everything that we learn about him, though. And the reason why I think him being so straightforward and simple, and even though I don't love the character, uh, the reason that is all okay for me is because this is really just about how how Nora feels about all of it. Mm-hmm. I mean, that is that is mm-hmm. the driving force of this movie. The conflict and the will they, won't they is only in her head, really. And it's the way that she is weighing different romantic scenarios and what she feels in the moment and the looks on her face that even if I... I, I like both actors and I think the characters are fine. I'm not head over heels in love with either of them, mm-hmm. but I like Nora so much and she is so well characterized and her thought process is so clear that even if his progression is okay, learning more about him, he becomes less of like the perfect imaginary guy. I think that's intentional and it's watching Nora sort of come to grips with that and realize where she has to balance like the life that she once wanted or might think is a ridiculous fantasy, but is achievable with the more realistic life that she's set up for herself and the way that like her different dreams like mm-hmm. sort of hit in midair like yeah. part ways through the film there's a... all about her mindset yeah i mean i think that the central idea of this film is i i some this some little log line description i saw was that it's it's about the choices that make up one's life and <laughs> that is yeah. to uh, seems to me that that's what the this film is is trying to investigate and and see you know how movable those choices are and how and and where certain people like choose to go and so i think you're right and and i i like nora's character quite a bit she's very interesting and i i feel like i know her when i'm watching the film i know what she's going to do and i remember i'm thinking while while it's going on i'm like wow she can't possibly leave her husband i mean they they seem like they love each other and the film does a good job i think setting up a lot of these dynamics we get this rich tapestry of emotion at the end of the film because we even though the film isn't very long we've actually spent a significant amount of time just setting up just laying our foundation so that mm. we can get that them standing in silence waiting for the uber and they're just like looking at each other and there's these very complicated emotions going on on their faces but they're not saying anything i think that's a super powerful moment that this film like and it's because of it's at the end it only works at the end of the film that they that we really get to i guess feel it'd be a lot weirder if we started in medias race but it was just them standing there looking at each other like who are these fucking people what's (laughs) happening (laughs) yeah Yeah. Yeah. um I mean, I, I, I agree that I, especially this time, I was, like, really appreciative of Nora as a character and her characterization throughout the film mm-hmm. and how Celine Song writes this character from the from the outset mm-hmm. um, because I find her to be a very emotionally mature character, very well put together, very intelligent, and ultimately, like, quite a, a a joyous character really like mm-hmm. a, a beam of light and like in the a film kind overall character yeah it's just yeah, like exactly a, a, a good person it's a ch- breath of fresh air to get a good person as the main character of a, of your movie <laughs> and th- this notion that we that we've been throwing around of a of this being a will they won't they kind of film i mean i don't think it is or the uh, at the very least not in a traditional sense mm-hmm. because i never feel as though there is a legitimate interest either on the part of Celine Song or the part of Nora as a character to like she says this literally to Arthur she's like yeah I'm gonna throw away my life and move to Korea with this guy like I feel like that's never a legitimate interest and more of the the film is far more concerned with like again Tim as we said the the possibility of that being my life choice and the overwhelming notion the existential notion of like how different would my life be 
Um, and of course, Hei Sung comes into it as, uh, I find it interesting that Timo that you said that you don't really care for him, that you don't like him, that he might be annoying in a lot of ways, because I've, I've actually seen this film three times. Um, I saw it the first time with you guys, second time in the theater with my girlfriend, and now this third time, um, just for the rewatch of this. And especially the second time that I saw it, I was like, Hei Sung kind of like, he's... I, I I guess I would I'd say I have an I had an uncharitable reading of him on my mm -hmm. second rewatch and this time now I'm like I I feel much I empathize a lot more with him I still feel like he is a a misguided an emotionally misguided character but I empathize with the point that that is coming from a place of pretty severe depression from him and like a dep a, a depressive episode that's kind of stemming from where he is in his life and, and he he's not at all happy with how his life shaped up. And ultimately, that's what the film is about, is kind of like making peace with the way that your life shaped up. Hmm. Um, yeah, that's a good point. And mm -hmm. like being secure in those notions. And yeah. the, huh. the moment at the end that you were talking about, Timo, is I think Nora the whole time being a very well put together character, very emotionally mature, it finally overwhelms her. Like, the confrontation is over. Song is going back. This this whole notion of a of a different life that she could have had, and that's of course uh, intermingled with the cultural things Tucker was talking about about you moving to a completely different nation, about having to live a completely different life, and on the other side of the world, it all overwhelms her in that moment, and that's why it's such a big emotional gut punch for me. That ending scene. Yeah, I. I... I don't think that this movie is really a, a, a romance movie. Yeah. I, I don't really think that that's what Past Lives is about. I, 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 wait, I'm wait, gonna... wait, 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 wait. Let me, let me explain what I mean. Let me explain what I mean. Before, instead of maybe in four words, let me give you more than that. Uh -huh. yeah, wait, I can only respond to you in four words? No, I said I only had given you four words. Oh, so, I said, so let me give you more. It might have been a little more than that. But, yeah. <laughs> let the record reflect? Uh -huh. <laughs> it might have been a little more than that. <laughs> This movie is not about whether Hei Sung is going to win the heart of Nora. Right. I don't think that that's, that's ever a possibility to Tanner's point. Mm -hmm. Because even when, after they've met in person for the first time, and Nora is recounting the experience to Arthur, Arthur's actually the one that takes him more as a romantic rival exactly. than Nora suggests. Yes. To the contrary, the only things Nora really reflects upon is that her proximity to Sung makes her feel both more and less Korean. Mm -hmm. And I think that ultimately, the movie is about Nora's life. Mm -hmm. and, and Nora, to your point, Tanner, having to reconcile the choices she's made, and Sung not being a potential husband, but a, 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 the ultimate token of what she, can, she chose to give up. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's the lens through which you have to, to read it. And, and I think that to understand Nora and Sung's relationship, you really have to just become immersed, which I think is easy to do, in Greta Lee's acting, which is why I think her snub is unconscionable this year. Yeah. But there's so many moments wherein there's almost this like... I just realized I thought she was nominated the whole time I was watching the movie. I'm like, oh yeah, she was one of the five... Oh, I, mean, I didn't read out the noms. You know, she's I'll, not. I'll, Abram, finish your point. I'll, I'll, pull, I'll pull those up. I, I, there, there are so many moments when she's almost patronizing towards him, mm -hmm. or or matronizing, I guess. Yeah. But mm -hmm. I, I, I don't get this spark of romantic tension out of them after she's already been married, mm -hmm. and so I think mm -hmm. that's what makes the structure of this film so interesting. Her, it's there's really three phases. There's a phase wherein she lives in Korea. Mm -hmm. There's a phase wherein she goes to America but still longs for connection to Korea through Hei Sung. Uh -huh. And then a final phase wherein she now lives in New York and has a life in New York, yeah. and Hei Sung is, a, 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 is that past that she's now rejected coming back to her. These yeah. three phases are almost like, they're almost like acts in a way. Yes. <laughs> and, and I, in some strange sense. And I think that's the lens through which we have to discuss this yeah. film. Yeah. I, sure. I, I, don't, I think that Hei Sung is... is Hei Sung... And in his mind, the film is a romance. Uh -huh. In her mind, he is a a representation of a life she no longer lives. Exactly. Okay. Am I allowed to? Uh, was that what was that? But five you, words, but maybe? you only get four words. This okay. Tucker only gets four uh, words. You're wrong, dumbass. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there's oh. four words. Right. And, and the reason I, I I so explicitly would say I feel this film is a romance is not only because 
in especially in that first half of the film, it's entirely about that flirting and the chemistry uh, between them over uh, over Skype mm -hmm. and her longing for that and the longing for that connection that is obviously sparked initially by romance. They felt that at the beginning. And the idea of them coming back together is that ultimate long distance romantic spark long across the entire like what two and like two and a half decades. Yeah. And I also so structurally, I think, in terms of having a meet cute with their date and then they're, they're, they're flirting on Skype and then uh him him coming back and again, even if it is just in his mind, the will they won't they of he's obviously trying something yeah. to rekindle that that connection. But I also do think that in terms of the themes and the way that Nora's um, viewing all of their relationships, it's through that lens of romance is something that shapes our lives. The relationships that we build with the people close to us, primarily those romantic relationships, are the ones that shape the life decisions that we make. And so the way that she is obsessed with Sung in that second act and realizes she needs to cut that off because the tension for her has become overwhelming and she feels like she needs to cut out the romantic edge that they have. Uh, in order to move on with the rest of her life and by the f time that she has that uh, we, we we i think we skipped the entire part of the movie that would actually just be the normal romance movie where they they meet at the thing and then they go on dates and then they move in to save rent they get married that would be the normal romance film but i feel like the idea of this film presents is that even outside of just a traditional you meet someone else move in together marry spend a lot of time together romance Romance is something more complicated and impacts your life and the way that you view other people in relationships in much larger ways. And so by the point that Sung returns, Sung and Arthur, and I, I do believe Nora, to a certain extent, all view this as a as a potential issue of, of love and the way that she is seeing things of, of him, that, that, that he's handsome and I don't know if he's, she's attracted to him, but I think there are, there's this element underlining the entire thing of this connection goes deeper than just a friendship re recognition or someone from my childhood. This is someone that she does have feelings for. And the fact that she's re what it's a romance in that she's, I feel like she's trying to reject the romantic feelings or trying to wrestle with the fact that she's not sure if she, if she should be having romantic feelings, but she does and she pushes them away and sometimes she lets them in. And so it's not a traditional romance movie, but I feel every care, every character action and, uh, and the structure and the themes are all tied back into a much more mature and realistic version of romance. This isn't, we just fall in love and that's it. And maybe there's a fight or two. <laughs> this is romance is something much larger than that and impacts our lives and the way we change, uh, change each other in different ways. That's interesting. Cause I, I agree with you in some respects, but I also think other respects is that the film explicitly goes against what you're saying, mm. because even in the case of, of uh, Nora's relationship to Arthur, we're told at multiple points in the film that that was a a, a pragmatic relationship. Yeah, no, absolutely. They and and Arthur even questions this notion of. Yeah. He, he says to Nora, "If there had been a different writer with you at the residency, yeah. would you be lying with him mm -hmm. instead?" Because he said, "We read the same books. You needed a green card, and we ended up getting married. We even when they accelerated their marriage yeah. for the sake of that green card." I think that there's that there's a, a different dimension to the relationship between Heisung and Nora for sure, but I just don't think that it is a nest, it is for in the foreground a romantic one, hmm. because again we're we're viewing this film entirely through through the prism of Nora's life. Yeah, obviously. And and Nora's life, she she even says I wouldn't delay my rehearsal for a man. Mm -hmm. I think that this film is really interesting in that way, in that Nora is the least romantically concerned character Absolutely. in the film. Yeah. It's actually both of the men who yeah. are, are bristling in that way, wherein she, she isn't. And even when she cuts off her relationship from a song in the second act of the film, this is maybe just a different reading, but she talks about how I'm wasting my time spending my days looking for a flight back to Seoul. Yeah. It's not trying to, you know, it's not a way to get back to you. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe, maybe yeah. you want to say some kind of romantic subtext or whatever, but I think that in a film that is primarily concerned with immigration and culture, mm. through, through these lenses, the, he is a return to soul. It's not a return to a soulmate. Not to do a little, <laughs> little play on words for you. Oh, shit. That was awesome. So, mm -hmm. I, I do have to push back again, though, because you bring up the sequence where they're in bed and they're talking about their, yeah. their past and how what we know of their relationship does seem like it isn't 
it, it's it's far from a traditional yes. what you would expect to be a romance. But again, I I need to return to my idea of this not being a romance film in the way that we know romance film to be, sure. but a much more mature and realistic understanding of what romance is in real life and in their situation. It's not literally they were just soulmates and they want to spend all their time together. I mean, we know they have feelings for each other, but it's a little more complicated. Yeah. It is a much more mature understanding of this is sometimes what romance is. This is not my soulmate and we fell in love and that was it. Yeah. It's this was a situation and they have developed feelings for each other. They had sparks of, of connection at the beginning and that, and that still is romance though. And I think that even when the film is saying, we need to push away the romance to move on to other parts of our lives. I still think that is romance, romance as the push, as the sure. uh, igniting force that it, when she's pushing back against it, it's, it's still there. It's that decision that changes everything. Mm. Close the book on the discussion and, and put a nail in it. Letterboxd does categorize it as a romance film. So well, there you I, go. Yeah, I lose. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> let's get those noms. I want to hear what this film oh, yeah. well, the Academy I realized it film. saying that, like, oh, I should pull it up. I don't need to. This film was nominated for Best Picture and Best Original Screenplay. That's it. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Um, okay. So, so, can, so now, I, now that that's all been hashed out, can, go ahead, Timo. I. I hate to circle us back because there's a lot more oh, to talk about, but I'm, I'm, I'm not going <laughs> to go back to their point. Tanner actually yeah. made a change in my thinking. I was talking about how I don't like Song's character, and I was like, okay, well, where where is it? That I, let's let's dive, let's go a little deeper into that. I'm in mm -hmm. a, I'm in a therapy mood. I, I shall say. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I only dislike his character in the third act, and your idea, sure. Tanner, that he is undergoing a a radically different mental state than Nora is, I think is actually something that I wasn't really considering before. And that his, like, sadness and, and kind of his inability to get over Nora, that, that there is yeah. an, an, a missed connection there that he still seeks and that Nora is that other, the other side the, who, is, who is confident and settled in her romantic situation the way that i see hey song at the at the end of the film is this very like he's agitated and nervous and unconfident um kind mm -hmm. of a, a, a not a very likable guy but i'm now going to twist that from a i don't i am unhappy about this to i think that's a quite an interesting turn for the character to take and one that supports the theses that you guys are making about the maturity of the romance in this film that that by having a character who acts i guess in a in, a, in an equally realistic but a little maybe less self-assured and a less mature way it really i yeah. think highlights and exemplifies nora's own maturity Mm -hmm. in a, in a very and maturity of the writing yeah and a, exactly a maturity of the writing to to be able to kind of pull that out and i'm like i actually don't dislike him at all in the second act and in the first act he's a kid so he's just you know he's kind of you yeah know, i don't know uh -huh. i hate him the most and that one obviously <laughs> i hate child actors <laughs> <laughs> it's funny that we, we talk about these acts but it's really like uh but one third of the first half two thirds of the first half and then the second half yeah, yeah, yeah. that's the yeah. three act structure yeah, <laughs> yeah. A third of, a third of a second third of the first half. No, two thirds I, of the first half. I, 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 oh, I, I see what you mean. Two thirds of the first half. They progressively gotcha. get longer, is my point. I gotcha. Okay, Three I gotcha. thirds I gotcha. of the whole movie. This Correct. Is the whole movie. <laughs> yes. <laughs> One movie. <laughs> we did it. <laughs> There's a really interesting moment uh, with Hei Sung mm -hmm. before he goes to New York um, where he is at the Soju bar with his friends. Mm -hmm. And one of his friends asks, um, you going back to New see York her. to see yeah. her, and he says, oh, oh, just vacation. Oh, what?" And then his, <laughs> he went, you, you. yeah, and, and his friend says, "Why are you pretending to not know who I'm talking about?" Uh -huh. And I think that that's totally right. There is this really interesting sense of inadequacy in the character of Hae Sung. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah, and he and vocalizes it in a different sense at a different yeah. part of the movie. He he's not confident in himself to go to New York to win Nora back on any explicit level, but he also does. He also clearly doesn't think highly of himself, as we learn about his notion of marriage and what he must do as an only son yeah. mm -hmm. to marry. But I think this again goes back to why I view this film. I think principally through the, the lens of like culture and cultural differences, mm -hmm. because I find that that particular notion to be really interesting because Nora re rejects the, the, this this uh, archetypally Korean way of understanding marriage. 
So I, I, I think that Hey Sung is this sort of interesting, like emotionally repressed, and as you're saying, depressed, but I would say mm-hmm. just sort of almost self loathing character in the film. Yeah. Ooh, well, the film I, I think that's. The yeah, film, ahead, I mean, Nora labels him in the second act as being she's like he's so korean that's the only way that she Mm -hmm. can really describe him and like you were talking about earlier how it makes her feel disconnected i think abram that's a really intelligent reading of the film to see it from a a cultural point of view because i think everything that you're saying is supported by the text and that's an it's a very interesting idea that i mean the double immigration that nora takes as a character Mm -hmm. that she was a a korean a canadian and a new yorker like those are that's a very Three countries. Yes. Multifaceted identity. And uh, that like New York mindset seems to be engendered in her character. And she is, mm-hmm. is it reflects like the, that, that city life kind of way. And is clear. Absolutely. Like, and, and it, that is so, so different from how Hey Sung's yeah. character comes across. Yeah. I mean, Ultimately, I feel you know, the, the truth of the matter, as it often is, I feel lies in the middle between it's about culture, it's about romance, it's about both, and it, it's it's ultimately How about, about the where culture and romance meet. Exactly, it's 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 an intersection, it's intersectionality between all of these things that drives the film and the character moments and everything. Yeah, we took sociology classes. Yeah, I get it. I know. <laughs> um, but you know, ultimately, I, and I think Nora says this in so many words. In that, you know, in in the the final the final big scene uh, in the bar there, where Nora says, "Hey, Song is ultimately in love with," or she says this to Arthur too early in the film. She's like, "He's ultimately in love with a version of me that doesn't really exist anymore." Like in, in the film, you know, does does this very philosophical, you know, very meaningful emotionally thing, like. It's not that the little girl you yet you knew and we were in love with doesn't exist. It's that she exists in your head now, like, and I'm me. She's, and I, not, she's different she, than me. She's, she's not, not sitting across yeah. from you in the bar anymore. Um, and that's who that's who Hey Song is in love with, and that's who he's chasing. That's who he's idealizing. That's why he went to New York. Is that version that he's trying to reclaim, like that moment in his life where. He's happy and these thoughts that he imagines when he's happiest, that's what is that's what he's trying to recapture. And Arthur, you know, I think, you know, what if we're talking about how this is a romance film, we're leaving out a very important third leg of this film, which is Arthur. Yeah, he's uh, got a third leg. <laughs> hello. Arthur is in love with the current version of Nora that exists. And that's why I say it's about coming to terms with where you are in your life and sort of like being comfortable with that when anxieties like the arrival of Hey Song arrive, when those arise, it's about being comfortable in that and, you know, having a person to rely on and being able to talk to them about those things. Um, I love Arthur and Nora's relationship in this film. It's very open. It's very honest. And it's like got some of the like some of the most heartfelt writing in the whole thing yeah. when they're lying in bed and he's talking about like, I wanted to learn Korean because you, you, you speak in Korean in your sleep. I know I want to know what you're dreaming about. I want to know what you're talking about in those moments. It's like Arthur cares so much for her. And to Abram's point is sort of he he's sort of like rom-com brained where he's like, I'm the evil white American bo- yeah. husband that's trying to keep you two apart, even though destiny is pulling you back together. That's not how real life is, and this is a, a very naturalistic film, as Tucker is saying, very realistic in, in its depictions and its conversations about romance and, and, and romantic partners and, you know, people coming back into your life from decades ago. Yeah. It's like, we're real people don't throw everything out a window and, and go run away on a whim. It's People have lives that are built up and relationships that are built up, and they act from the moment that they are in right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's why I find this idea of Inyun in the film so interesting, mm-hmm. because it's essentially it's it's a compounding idea. And let me know if I if I'm not explaining it right. But okay. essentially, every small interaction between two people is Inyun, mm-hmm. and over lifetimes, the Inyun builds, and and these these fleeting moments become something larger and larger and larger and larger as people gain a presence yeah. in each other's lives. Mm-hmm. And the idea is, every person you've ever met, you will eventually marry. Well, the idea is that a Korean every person wants to sleep with you. Yeah. Every <laughs> That's the idea. <laughs> every, uh-huh. every one of your teachers, it goes all down the hill. Uh-huh. The, the reason I, I love this idea so much in the context of the film is because 
it is just this notion of small it, it is this philosophical and, and spiritual way to think about the idea of in the in the case of one life the small decisions you make compounding yeah and over time resulting in the life you now have yeah and, and i think that that's a, a really powerful idea and i think that's ultimately what nora is reckoning with mm-hmm. she can't it, it, she can't like unin her life. No, she can't. She can't take the 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 life that she's built step by step back. Right. And what does it mean to get confronted with that life that you couldn't have? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I and and that's I think what I why I really love this movie. Not only do I think that it's one of the most modern movies in terms of its its use of Skype and stuff like I said earlier, but it also has such a refreshingly discussionary take on philosophy and the way that that impacts different people's viewpoints and the way that we just think about the progressing through our own lives. I just, I love watching characters sit there and talk about the way that they are worried about things and how they have thought about that. They like, they have obsessions about what I, I could have done something differently. I, this has been sitting in the back of my mind and it's changing the way that I not only interact with you, but think about interacting in the future. And that is something that is so relatable and realistic to me. And I haven't really seen portrayed to this depth in a film that I think really pushes it over the bar in terms of something that really brings something fresh to modern film writing in terms of the movies that I've seen. And Nora's, the idea that you're bringing up of Inyun and interactions also mirroring, mirroring the way that we interact with people and build relationships over time and make small micro decisions that lead to bigger decisions. It's I, I, I've watched this movie twice, but it's one of those movies that I feel like if I watch every couple of years until I die, I, I, I still won't know what it's saying because that's the point is you never fully know mm. what all these decisions will mean and you'll always feel uncomfortable in the moment. There will never come a moment where you're like, oh, I've made it and this mm. is it. You're always taking that next step forward into your life and I love that we watch this sort of middle chapter of Nora's life where we skip the entire part of her naturalizing in Canada and moving to New York and we skip her entire relationship with uh, with Arthur, as it, we see the very beginning of it, and then we were literally a decade established mm-hmm. at that point. I love that it is taking this sort of macro look into this woman's life through microscopic interactions because that feels so genuine to me. Of she's so well written, and you see the mannerisms that she has, and the clothes that she wears, and the way that she talked about her philosophy of life and, and her culture. That you don't need the other stuff. You can you can. Fill in those gaps because she's so well realized and you understand her philosophy, but it makes you think about your own philosophy. And I, I just think it's really, really remarkable what they crafted. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I said it towards the beginning, but I just love Nora and how intelligent she is, emotionally intelligent, especially. Like, there's the moment where she um, she comes home. I, I believe it's when she comes home from meeting his song for the first time. And, you know, she said mm-hmm. she immediately yeah. recognizes <clears throat> that. You, Arthur, you're right. He came here to see me. Like yeah. uh, Hazel never explicitly says that, yeah. but it's blatantly evident. And through, I don't think Arthur ever asks that on screen. No, and he doesn't. Yeah. Um. I mean, and she also like, but she she also has to like diffuse his insecurities about it when he's asking like, well, do you find him attractive? And she's like, I'm not gonna play this game. I guess so. I mean, I'm gonna be honest with you in the right now. Uh, I I just love all of that and again like i said that's why it feels like such a gut punch to me to see her cry at the end of the film yeah. is that like even though that she has you know she she is very well put together she knows she she can process these feelings quite healthily it's still too much for her at the end of things and like well what, you know, and, and what does she do she she goes back in and, and, and arthur comforts her and they go back yeah. into their house like and I think that that last moment solidifies one of my favorite themes in the film, mm-hmm. which is attempting to understand someone in a different situation from yourself. Mm-hmm. The way that we learn to connect to each other. And actually, this is very similar to the themes we were talking about in um, the holdovers of just understanding someone, even if you have never and will never be in their situation, trying to empathize mm-hmm. and understand the situations that they've been in that have led them to these emotional moments and whatever strong thoughts or feelings they may have and 
I, I think that Arthur is a very key part of this because he he is the one that is the most distance mm-hmm. from the primary relationship of this film, which is between Hesung and, and Nora. And watching him discuss and be very, very, very open of the fact that I don't know how I feel about this, and I don't know how what you feel about this, and I don't know this guy, uh-huh. and and I don't know if I'll ever be okay with this, but we can just do the best we can in the moment, and then with the moment where she comes and cries on his shoulder, it signifies so much because it signifies that he cares to, about her on such a deep level that he recognized something was wrong without he her, her even coming to tell him. Mm-hmm. He came down the stairs before she came up. Mm-hmm. He he walks over to her as as she's like sort of slumped over and then he holds her and, and you can I, at least i can hear the thoughts going on in his head mm-hmm. in that moment of I, I don't know why she's crying necessarily i don't know what was said i don't know what what how what happened on these other uh, adventures that they went on or what ha- really happened in their past but i know that i care about her and that she's having a strong emotional moment uh, in this moment and i need to do my best mm-hmm. to support her through this because I care about her. And I just think that's a, like, without a single word being said, it communicates so, so, so much. I mean, I don't think that he came down the stairs at the right time. I think he was probably watching from behind the thing. He's like, <laughs> He's like boom. You better not fucking kiss her, you son of a bitch. You better not fucking. <laughs> I, think, I think that Arthur is a, a, a beautiful character in, in the narrative. And I want to build off the idea you have, Tucker, of, of um, finding an, an empathy. Because I, I think that when we get into this, third phase of the film there's this idea of uh loving in, in like a non-possessive way mm-hmm. and there's a really interesting line shared and a moment shared between hey sung and arthur when um when nora has gone to the bathroom in the bar mm-hmm. and arthur says to hey sung i'm glad you came and you made the right choice yeah and, and i think that this is um a really interesting moment because Arthur is is a character who whose insecurities, aside from the one is a Hey Sung hot moment. Yeah, his insecurities come from a very deep love of Nora and fearing like he can't love her enough. Yeah. I think the and the moment where he says, "You make my life so much bigger," and I don't know yeah. if I'd do that to you. I mean, yeah. that is mm-hmm. one of the best lines in the entire movie. Well, that's, Absolutely. that's actually exactly what I was about to say. I, um. <laughs> I think that that's one of the most beautiful lines I've I've heard in a long time. Mm-hmm. I think that really conveys the position. You should with... go rewatch Quest. <laughs> I, I, I hear I a lot think... of beautiful lines. <laughs> I think that that. Um, what was I going to say? Beautiful I, line. It's a beautiful line that encapsulates the way in which he he moves through the narrative, mm-hmm. and the reason that I find this film very therapeutic and, and heartbreaking and weird and interesting is because the 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 fact that Arthur is happy for Sung, the fact that I feel like in the nuances of Greta Lee's acting, how she kind of placates Sung and goes on all of these um, excursions with him, illustrates that all these characters are doing things they don't personally want to do, for the benefit of the people around them. Mm. I really do think when you when you pay attention to the nuances of the ways that Nora tries to propel a conversation when Sung has gone quiet or being responding, wow, it's so interesting, there's no overtime pay in Korea or mm-hmm. things. She is being something for him that she doesn't want to be. And I think she affirms that when in the last moment before Sung leaves in a taxi, he says, in our, what do you think we are in our next life together? Mm-hmm. Where, where, and he's clearly looking for a, a reaffirmation of the, the romance that he came here for might exist yeah. at some point. And instead of giving him that, she says, "I don't know," which I think is her, which I think is her tacitly saying what has been on her face this whole time, which is, "It's not here anymore." Yeah. yeah. And I think that Arthur and her being things they don't want to be for for Hey Sung is a really beautiful part of the film. Mm-hmm. I want to talk about Hey Song a little bit more. Sure. Okay. Um, and I think I, I, we should do something that I think people should do for every movie character, for every film they ever watch. You know, like sort of examine the moral character of him and if we agree with him or not, or you know, if he's a good guy. Essentially, I'm joking, of course, but I I, I just really am trying to like process, as I mentioned, the, the feelings that the, how my feelings on him as a character have evolved over the, my three watches of this film. Um, 
And I particularly want to drill in on a line that I always end up thinking about a lot. And it's the line that he says to Nora in the bar. He says, you're a person who leaves. Like, that's who, that's who you are. Mm-hmm. Uh, or per- perhaps that's who you are to me. And I think that's a, that's a critical distinction, and I should be able to remember which one he says well, specifically. He says you're a person who leaves, but to Arthur, you're a person who stays. Yeah, okay. Um, and I was like, is that, a, is, that a, is that a fair assessment of Nora on Sung's part? Or, like, does he still not really get it? He, I think he, it's a fair subjective uh, on a reading, because he honestly does not know her very well. Mm -hmm. And the only things that he has truly experienced with her are that she left him when she was was a kid, Mm -hmm. and he seems to have reconciled that pretty solidly. I mean, of course, he's still searching for her and has been for for years at that point. Um, But he's like, yeah, okay, you you needed to do that. Like this, I can see this is how the person that you became. Mm -hmm. But then the second thing is that they're, they're having a pretty good long distance relationship or whatever through Skype. And then she's like, no, we need to stop. And so mm-hmm. his two major interactions with her are leaving. And so to him, she's a person that's always on the move and always getting out. And that's because he does not actually know her that well. Uh-huh. Um, and yeah. So, and that's, that's kind of clear about, about him as well. And I think that's again, like why I said it was so interesting that to him, he's still chasing the idealized version. Like he doesn't, doesn't really know her as she is right now, mm-hmm. ultimately. Yeah, because well, I feel like he, I feel like he did when they spent presumably months like talking to each other yeah. over Skype, like multiple times a day. I just I, in a quick moment I saw like their Skype log and it was like sometimes multiple calls mm-hmm. in a day. And I'm like, that's that. So, so you, you, Celine Song had her and like her intern like <laughs> doing the quick Zoom call or <laughs> quick good Skype calls every couple of days, make sure that was filled yeah. in, and that's good characterization work. Um, but yeah, I, I think that it is an interesting realization. Not only that is it is it a fair realization or not, because I don't know if necessarily that matters, but what really drives it home as something interesting to for him to say is mm-hmm. when he says to Arthur, you're someone who stays, because mm-hmm. it's him realizing that that is not a fair assessment. It's a fair mm-hmm. subjective assessment, but to the people that know her best, she's lived almost 40 years of her life or whatever, living in Canada and New York. Like, mm-hmm. like she's not a person who leaves. And yeah, he's yeah. like, to me, you are, but in reality, now that I know you a little bit better, I mm-hmm. realize that that's not accurate. Here's a thought I want to throw in here. Given, yeah, given that Nora was actually quite young when she left, did, did she... This film is about the choices that one makes of their life that and the choices that build up to become a, a life. The central choice to immigrate away from Korea was not hers presumably right. it's her parents choice and of then, course it wasn't yeah no i think she was real she she, she filled out the, uh, the passport paperwork and everything yeah. And, yeah. actually we explicitly see her not doing that because she's sitting on the floor at the airport while her parents are filling it out <laughs> <laughs> so i think that that's kind of a it's like a complication to this theme that says that even even the choices that are just made some of them you don't even get to make about your own life and that leads you mm-hmm. down different paths so i I, well, I think it's more just the choices that impact your life mm-hmm. i don't i don't know if i ever necessarily specified that it was the choices that you make i, I might have said that and that may have been a little faux pas no i don't not i'm uh, not accusing <laughs> nobody but i think it's a really interesting point you raised timo because ultimately that is the whole character of hey sung his, his entire life is is defined by the choice that somebody else made right and I think that that's really interesting. And there's this sort of interesting phenomenon that I have in my own life has noticed as of late, wherein now that we've graduated college, there's mm-hmm. people you, you talk to from college that you still talk to about life and things in the present. Mm-hmm. But there's some people you talk to and all you have to talk about anymore is what you guys did together at school. Right. And the reason I think that this is interesting to bring the conversation is because so much of what Sung says to Nora is about who she used to be. Mm-hmm. That's the only way he knows how to connect to her. Mm, yeah. It is, uh, oh, so what kind of award do you want to win now? Because back when you were a kid, you wanted to win the Nobel Prize, and mm-hmm. then it was the, the Pulitzer, and, and that's what that's the only way he knows how to fill the space. Mm-hmm. And so I think it's, it's, it's interesting that he sort of um, covets this idea of Nora that's gone, but doesn't know how to connect to her anymore. Mm-hmm. So I... To your point from earlier, Tanner, I I don't think that he views Nora fairly because he views 
he he almost objectifies Nora, but not in a sexual way, almost like in an emotional way. Yeah. She is this thing to him, but that's, she's not that anymore. Yeah, and, and that's what I was talking about. I, I especially felt that way when I watched it the second time, and now, like I said, I I, I uh, have a much more charitable reading of it, of his character, because especially from the, the, the final interaction that they have, um, especially from the final interaction that they have, I was like, so he's not like, he he gets it on a certain level, and you know, I, Tucker, I like your explanation of the of the what's going on here. <laughs> the mouse, uh, this is some inside baseball stuff's going on here, Tucker. I like your explanation of the you're someone who leaves, and um, of course it's a subjective line, and and I understand that, but yeah, he's it's it's followed up immediately with like to other people, you're someone who stays, and like so that's why I think that Hey Song, you know, he he's not like completely reformed at the end of the film but he has oh, much, no. he has yeah. a much he has a much healthier understanding of who Nora is and hopefully can go on to yeah. you know live a healthier life where he's not like obsessed he, he's not obsessed with her basically yeah. Yeah. I I love the I love the moment this is a small thing that kind of that kind of proves that that he's like she's like so have you ever you ever seen uh, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind? And then we hard cut to him watching it on his laptop. Yeah, he's, he's like, he's like anything, anything I can get, any connection I can get, I, yeah. cra I crave. Yeah, and I think that's another really important part of the themes of this film is the ways that you allow yourself to be contr controlled by your dreams mm -hmm. or have to fight the realization that sometimes things aren't fully achievable or in the way that you necessarily wanted them, and you have to balance that realism with the idea of, of making decisions that are um, that are, that are sometimes fanciful and outside of your comfort zone. But this movie does really interesting things with that because the entire movie is based around what did you feel in the past and how is that like intersecting with the current present and which way should your emotions fly? And I find that I find that really fascinating mm -hmm. um, because I do. Nice. I, I, I that was the last clause. I just kind of ended it. Uh. <laughs> I want to talk about because we've been doing a lot of character work and obviously a, lot, a lot of writing work, and that's what the, that's how, that's how the Academy sort of recognized this film, of course. But honestly, Past Lives is also just like a, a like a visual feast. It's I, a I, that, beautiful that, that, film. It is. It is just truly beautiful to look at. I mean, the richness of the color palette, and you know, we've seen New York put to film probably more times than any city ever in the history of yeah, yeah. cinema. Mm -hmm. Spider-Man 1, Spider-Man 2, Spider-Man 3. <laughs> Let's Spider list them all Spider here. Spider-Man 2, Spider-Man Home. <laughs> mean Street. City so, I don't know. Manhattan. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. 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 Any hall. Any, any <laughs> hall. <laughs> uh, but, like, this one, like, there's just something about how Celine's song visualizes New York that that's not, it doesn't make it, like, New York's a character or whatever. Mm -hmm. It just feels much more like like tactile, but also like soft and rich. I, I know exactly what you mean. To yeah. me, this is a very weird comparison to make. Okay. To me, it, it feels like the Rosetta Stone picture version of a place. And now for I those of you who did okay. not do Rosetta Stone, it is a language teaching uh, software yeah. in which you associate words. I did it for French when I was a kid. Associate words with really nice pictures, sure. just like really great <laughs> uh -huh. photography, and they all have this look about them. It's pictures of everything because it's uh -huh. teaching a language, and but it all shares this similar unrealistic color palette. Mm -hmm. But because it's so internally coherent, you feel a sense of heightened place. Mm -hmm. And I, I find the color palette in this movie to be so fascinating, and compelling because. In any other film with any other tone, I would really dislike the color grading here. Okay, it is. This sort of gray and like brown gold yeah, sort yeah, of yeah. kind of like a blue green tint to yeah, it all. kind of a misty like drizzly day kind yeah, of vibe. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I'm just I want to hammer that in. Uh -huh. uh, but I think it absolutely works here because, and again to to my, the, my internal connection of this with something like Rosetta Stone, I view it as this almost slideshow of a single photographer's best shots uh -huh. of. And with this slideshow accompanied by music, it creates this visual journey mm -hmm. where you're able to experience something that you were never there for. And I, I, I think it is is the color grading, the cinematography in terms of where the camera is placed in very interesting places. And I think especially the insert shots are really what contributes mm -hmm. to this of just a pond 
or a tree mm-hmm. or a windowsill or something than with one of the most chill ass scores <laughs> yeah. to ever be put to yeah, film. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it is it is absolutely fucking mesmerizing. And and it reminds me of my favorite uh, more amb- ambient scores that for me personally come from video games primarily mm-hmm. uh, games like Edith Finch and Firewatch and Abzu which are some of my favorite games because they create a vibe and an atmosphere through visual unique visuals and music that you can just exist in and Im- I-, I can sit here and imagine the light piano and mm-hmm. clarinet that is creating this soft score that's sort of enveloping everything I, I think it's I- it's one of the best combination even if i wouldn't say this is my favorite score of the year or this is my favorite cinematography of the year it's the combination of them that makes them one of the best visual audio yeah, experiences yeah. of the year i just think it's so tonally consistent the tone of the yes, film exactly uh is is so consistent across the visuals across the sound across the writing and the characters it's just like all the puzzle pieces fit together really nicely mm-hmm. and that's why it's such a great directorial debut yes. from so and so I think that the, the cinematography to me is is really um, it's really full of emotion in a way that I'm trying to exactly land my finger on mm-hmm. but I think that there's a really interesting amount of shots in this film that are framing our subject in a way that they are obscured or placed in the background. Oh, or in some way cordoned off into a part of the frame. I, I think my favorite example is when Sung arrives at his hotel in New York. Did I say that one? We, yeah. We see w- w- the camera is inside the lobby, so we're looking through um, the the decorations of the lobby, through the door of the building. Well, not even and, that. It's like on the ceiling of the lobby, so like the top half of the frame is covered with yeah. ceiling and the fucking light fixtures mm-hmm. or whatever. Yeah, and then you're looking through the doors, and then you're looking out to the taxi, and then you're seeing part of Sung exit, and then you see part of him reach into the trunk. Mm-hmm. The arrival of Arthur happens with this beautiful shot of Nora sleeping in the foreground, and you see Arthur arrive through a second-story window mm-hmm. down, like, in, in the top left of the frame. There's shots like this across the entire film, framing people in doorways, wherein the doorways and space fills up so much of them. I think this is a film that is very contemplative in how removed our characters are in the framing a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. And I find that really interesting. And I find it very melancholy. And I would describe the score as very melancholy. Sure, Mm yes. And there's a number of insert shots where where we just linger in places. Mm -hmm. And I think they ask you to really be in the moment in this interesting way. We are not plugged directly into a character, but you're plugged into kind of a mood. When the camera, I love the shot where the camera pans down to just a building on the waterfront in mm-hmm. New York, and then the lights go out. Yeah, I, I think it it all is a great New York movie. <laughs> on the waterfront, is that in New York? Yeah, I yes, so. I would mm-hmm. imagine so. Yeah, it is. I think it all sort of envelops you in this as almost greater than our characters' sense of the world. Uh-huh. The camera is often far away from them. Yeah. Um. I mean, I, I another one of my favorite just like total package directorial work scenes is when Nora and Sung meet up for the first time, which is obviously a very key scene in the film. But they, it's in this park in front of this, like, sort of interesting-looking uh, statue monument sort of thing. Which, interesting directorial choice, is also the last time they saw each other in front of the yeah, interesting the, yeah, well, and then, yeah, we, we cut to, like, a, we cut to that, that final moment. Oh, yeah. Um, well, the last time they see each other is on the stairs. I don't know. But we, we, we cut to their date essentially, yeah, like, last, last major like when they truly like sort of created this bond that then drives Hei Sung and to a certain extent drives Nora as well. Um, and then just the the soundscape as well. There's a, there's the wind in the trees, and you're looking at Nora, and you look back at Hei Sung, and the looks on their faces. They're not really saying anything. They just mm-hmm. take in the physical presence of each other for a while. And they do the, a lot of that. There's a lot of stare. There's a lot of staring going on between these yeah. two characters. Yeah. A lot of tension. A lot of a lot of things said that aren't exactly said in dialogue between these two characters. And in that way, I, I also love the you know the facial performances of yeah. of uh, of Tao Yu and especially Greta Lee. Yeah. But the soundscape of, of that moment of the city as it uh, sort of moves and and bustles, but it doesn't feel overwhelming. It just blends very naturally yeah, with very, the soft. It's very, very flowy score. 
Yeah, it's, yeah. really it, it's, chill it's, mix. It's maybe really the yeah. chillest New York has ever been. Well, no, absolutely, <laughs> and, I, and I, I think that that is driven home by the sound design of. There's this moment that the sound design of New York City, like they have the window open or whatever, or they're mm-hmm. they're somewhere in New York City, and it's wind and it's like soft honking in the background, mm-hmm. people you know moving around, um, and then it hard cuts to either silence or much quieter sound design, mm-hmm. and I don't remember where the cut is. But it made me realize that they have created a audio version of New York that is so much less obtrusive than actual <laughs> New York, especially as someone who has interviewed many people that are in New York and uh-huh. living in New York apartments. You cannot escape from it, even if uh, your window is closed. So you, you might hear in the last episode, depending how good uh, the uh, the uh, sound mixing is by our very own engineer, Timo Nelson. Nelson. That would be really good. Um, Sam Meltzer lives in New York City, and yeah. oftentimes when we're recording with him, I was like, okay, there's a, there goes in a, another yeah, fire yeah. truck but or something. But it's so inescapable, and I think in this movie, it becomes a bed yeah. that feels inviting. It yeah. feels alive and bustling, but not mm-hmm. like it's like hammered on your window. Or uh, like not a jackhammer. Yeah. No, there's, mm-hmm. I, there's not a jackhammer sound. Not a jackhammer in earshot. I yes. want to actually, I, I want to actually invert that a little bit. Okay. Because to go back to the scene you're mentioning, when they meet in front of the monolith, mm-hmm. the camera pans. Was 2001? Them. They're not very close together, or, or sorry, they are fairly close together in in literal space, uh-huh. but they don't seem very close together because the camera pans for yeah, slowly yeah. for a long time between mm-hmm. them. Yeah. I think a lot of this film works. Again, if we're reading this, and I think we must, even though it's hard for us to do as people who aren't immigrants, mm-hmm. read it as a, a text in some way about leaving your ho- your home and arriving in a new place. Mm-hmm. I think this film plays on space a lot in ways that make our characters not feel comfortable in the frame, mm-hmm. which goes back to the shots you were mentioning before, but it also goes back to how slowly the camera's moving between them, making space feel odd. But I think also the score is important because New York is represented in a way that we know as people who have an understanding of New York as an inverse. Mm-hmm. This New York is quiet and peaceful. It's a New York where you can see your spouse across the street and you guys can meet in the middle of the street and kiss and have a moment together. Great point. Yeah, mm-hmm. But you can't do that in New York for no, real. You run over. <laughs> and, and so this. Hey, oh, I'm, I'm, walking, walking, hey, I'm kissing, I'm kissing here. Here. Yeah. I walked into that one. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. I think that there I think that there is this sense of cultural displacement also. Sure. Uh-huh. But through an irregular lens, wherein the alien or foreign feeling here mm-hmm. is not one of of heightened stress mm-hmm. or heightened danger but it's of an almost eerie melancholy in a place where that melancholy usually doesn't exist that's one of the most analytical things we've ever said on quest that was impressive i liked it here's what, here's what i'll say last thing i have to say about past lives it's the one aspect of this film that i am that i do not love Uh-oh. wholeheartedly and do not have like have, have glowing things to say about it's the opening scene sure the scene where we, we start, we we do kind of start in Medias Race. We do, kind yeah. Of, yeah. Uh, mm. where, where we are in the shoes, in the eyes of another couple or another pe- group of people who are, to get, who are together looking across the bar at Sung, Arthur, and Nora. Mm-hmm. And, you know, with the, the dialogue is like, who do you think they are to each other? And there's speculation about this. I'm like... To, to echo something that we to speaking speaking of analyzing things and to echo some things that other people have said uh, about various films uh, as we review the nominees is like I like I get it like like and it, it to me it's just a little it's just a little obvious to open it up on that it's just a little bit too like oh who who are the who are these people sitting across the bar who could these people possibly be to each other oh, i don't know well, I Shall hope we explore their story a little in bit in the next like, hour and 40 minutes i hope i mm-hmm. find out yeah yeah, yeah. It, it's just a little too mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. and yeah. here's where and here's where this movie starts for me although I, I i agree with how on nose it is and yeah. and when you read it as like Oh, whom do you do? Like, oh, like, this is sure going to be interesting. <laughs> I, I do think that you're totally right that it feels at odds with the rest of the film, but I uh-huh. also do think that it, it's fitting as an introduction because it is yeah. coming from the outsider's lens as we are as viewers, yeah. looking into the life of people that, for the majority of the audience, are are very different from them. 
artists that live in New York that mm-hmm. get married because they're they need their green card that have a, a long lost lover that is skyping in from mm-hmm. Korea. That's not a situation that any of us are ever going to be in, or not anytime soon, at mm-hmm. least. I hope we all eventually speak for yourself. Well, I, I hope, we, nice. I hope we all go back to Skype yeah. <laughs> as well. <laughs> Screw this Discord <laughs> thing. Yeah. Um, but I think that the way that the film starts of trying to understand someone else's life, yeah, yeah, outside of really knowing them, mm-hmm. is is a mirror of the greater themes of the film. This unseen couple, uh, friends, whoever it doesn't really matter, dis- discussing. What do we think they're up to and reading into their life farther than they should? That is where most of the conflict from this movie comes in, in not actually knowing someone, making assumptions about them mm-hmm. and and being distant from them. And the fact that we're seeing them across the bar and not seeing the person who's talking, I think, all contributes to this feeling of this movie's going to be about about making assumptions about other people and and especially because they're discuss- they're talking about what choices do we think led to this? Who do mm-hmm. we think they are to each other? And that's the kind of relationship analysis that less on the nose than this, and certainly through the lens of uh-huh. the actual developed characters, but it is what the movie is actually about. And so I yeah. think I think it's a unique way to open it. But I agree, it's not, it's not my favorite part of the movie. Yeah. But. Yeah. I'll just echo you two knuckleheads on the Zone of Interest review and say, I get it. You don't need it in there. I get it. I get it. I I, I agree with I agree with Tanner. Ultimately, yeah. I mm-hmm. think it's like well, it's fine. I'll, yeah, whatever. I, but I think the reason it feels particularly heavy handed is because there's the the sort of voice of the outsider, as we can call it, I guess, mm-hmm. and isn't present nowhere else in the mm-hmm. film. So as a kind of way in, whatever. Yeah. I, I I don't I agree with you. I don't think it's especially strong. Mm-hmm. Um, but also I uh, I'm still giving the movie a ten. So whatever. Well, I'm, I'm <laughs> taking I'm gonna take four points off my score just okay. because, of, because I just you know. <laughs> okay. Let's put right. some numbers in there. I'll say that there. I'll say that it's it, it's like a guiding question. It's like when you get that easy easy reading guide from your teacher or whatever back in high school, and then and sure. it would give you all the answers in the questions like. Yeah. Nobody else put in a score yet. That's okay. It's okay. No, Hang on. Saying, nobody else put in. Stop the count. Stop, Stop the, the count. count. Oh, I just wanted to oh, I see. <laughs> uh, yeah, let's do, let's do that. Let's Stop do that. the count. Okay, ready? Three, I, two, I one. Go. <laughs> okay. I stole your job. We have a score, and what do you know? It is going to the top. Past Lives got a 9.3, which is going to be better than anything else on the list. So we have a new number one for 2024. Wow. Yeah. Nice. Congratulations. It's because it's the first one that hasn't been by someone given a 7 or, or an 8 or lower. Yes. Wow. Interesting. The point breakdown being I gave the film an 8.5. Tanner gave it a 9.2. Tucker gave it a 9.6, and as we already know, Abram gave it a 10.0. Wait, Very how did you nice. know that? Wait a second, hold on. Wait, okay. like, are you some kind of mind reader, Timo? I was, was going to say, telepathy. You shouldn't make assumptions about his life. Yeah, what's going on with you, Timo? We just talked about this for a fucking hour and 15 minutes. <laughs> now, these guys have... Ted has been saying he's got a number of 10s in store. Yeah. There's maybe maybe two other 10s. Okay. That's maybe your line. two, but probably zero. Probably zero. Okay, maybe two, probably zero. There's two that could. <laughs> okay. Because here's the way I think about it. Sure. Like if I give the movie a 5 out of 5 on Letterboxd, it just uh-huh. gets a 10. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, I, yeah, I feel the same way. That's true. Yeah. yeah. That, that, numer- that, that checks makes out. Sense. That checks out. <laughs> yeah, but technically, like, a four and a half is a nine. Yeah, but uh, there's so a, you, I know what you mean, Abram. Yeah. I thought about this yeah. as well. I was like, so I so a, a four and a half can go anywhere from, from, anywhere from a nine to a 9.9, and then a five out of five is just a 10. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. And ultimately, yeah. I'll be honest, I've said, I said this over and over again in Quest. Uh, I think about my arbitrary. score 30 seconds before I put it in. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's fair. <laughs> I, I, make, I make no promises about what my <laughs> scores will be or how many 10s I'm holding in my back pocket. I only make the scores up mm. while I'm typing. I want to get a look at those pockets. <laughs> <laughs> See all those scores. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, what are we going to watch next week? We are going to watch... Are you just coming up with it now? <laughs> <laughs> no, I thought about it. No, no we, I was trying to think of a way to like lead into it in this sort of fanciful way. No, we're, just, we're gonna watch American Fiction. Okay, cool. If, okay. That's, okay, if that's cool with you guys. Yeah. I, should, I guess I don't really consult you guys. No, no, you, no, no, no. you just kind of decide. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. We gotta do them all anyway. Uh, yeah. we, we gotta go back to the theater for this one, right? Yes. 
Because it's not streaming yet. No, not streaming is it yet. still showing? Yes, it is. Okay. So there's plenty of show times. Okay. Yeah. It's a great movie. Yeah. Abram, movie. Have you seen it? We all have. We saw it. Yeah. Oh, have you seen yeah. it, Timo? I have not. It'll be. I'll be watching okay, it there you go. for the first and only time. Well, hopefully, there's a show timer on Timo. There is the only time you're ever going to watch your entire life? Probably. Jesus. <laughs> yeah, yeah. otherwise we'll have to change it but you know we're gonna watch american fiction yeah we'll we'll be watching american fiction i'm excited i've seen the trailer for this one um so yeah and it's it's in theaters all over austin it'll be no problem the last last one we have to watch in theaters it's a very austin core movie but that's the last one we're going to watch in theaters though oh that's true that's true is it the don't look up of this year no what no it's not um don't worry it's the closest of i don't the I, listen i don't want to show my hand early and get i, I want to give any thoughts on the film but it's, we'll find out. It's the closest to the 10 of the Don't Look Up, but I think yes. it's not. It's multiple times better than Don't Look Up. Don't, <laughs> don't you worry, Timo. Don't well, you worry. You guys don't you making, worry. Don't you worry, You're just head. making me more excited for it. So. It's going to be a, the same uh, score. Yeah, I'm sure. Okay. It's going to be a banger quest episode. Yeah. Stay tuned. Yeah, four writing. white guys talk about black writing. <laughs> hey, listen. There's one, there's one every year. Yeah. We have to like, well, actually, we might have... We, we kind of have multiple this year. What didn't I say... Uh, on a previous review, that what, what, what I don't know, doesn't matter. Yeah, it was us talking about feminism. That's right. Yeah. Thank you. We're talking Thank feminism you. again still. That's true. We do. We do. Well, for all the hot button issues, <laughs> Actually, we're of avoid today's... feminism on the Barbie review. <laughs> <laughs> I just not, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> not yeah, bring yeah. that up. Yeah. Oh boy. And all we right. will not discuss Cold War politics when Oppenheimer comes around either. That's true. Oh. We won't. We won't. They're talking about Barbie still. <laughs> what? <laughs> well, they, they do mention some Cold War politics in Barbie. One of, one of my favorite the jokes in the whole road. movie. Yeah, I get it. Wrap up the episode, Timo. For the hot takes on, okay, right here, keys. backlot banter. Don't even close the tab. All the links for good stuff are in the description. <laughs> Until next week, stay warm, keep cool. Peace.